talk about organelles. Are you rolling? Okay. Organelles and protein sorting is the topic of discussion for today. We've talked about membranes. Membranes are barriers to ions and macromolecules. They contain lipids and proteins. And they separate the inside of the cell from the outside. The inside has a different composition of proteins and ions than the outside. Membranes form a barrier for organelles and wall off segments of the cytoplasm so that certain things can be isolated. Membranes are barriers. The cytoplasm, that's the entire inside of the cell, <laughs> is packed with organelles. I don't know about standing on the table. You can think of it like a thick stew instead of a thin soup. The cytoplasm is a fluid, but it's really semi-fluid. The organelles really encompass large parts of the cytoplasm. So why do cells have organelles? Membranes are barriers, so they compartmentalize molecules such as digestive enzymes and lysosomes or reactions such as the citric acid cycle that we learned about in mitochondria. Certain molecules are concentrated. We talk about neurotransmitters being concentrated in synaptic vesicles, and they're secreted in response to an action. <coughs> Organelles can store energy, energy as we learned about from studying mitochondria and chloroplasts. So this energy is used to make ATP and do work in the cell. And of course, we've also talked about separating the eukaryotic cells, transcription and splicing in the nucleus from translation in the cytoplasm. Organelles were thought to arise by involution of membrane. In prokaryotes, the chromosomes are attached to the membranes. So are ribosomes, typically, for membrane proteins. There are cases of bacteria that look like this, in which part of the plasma membrane has involuted, and the chromosomes are attached to that. It doesn't take much to jump to a eukaryotic cell, where the entire chromosome is covered by this double membrane. Note that it's a double membrane because it came from the outside of the cell, the plasma membrane. And so topologically, the cytoplasm is the same as the nucleus. The nucleus has the nuclear force, the gate transport. Similarly, mitochondria and chloroplasts and other plastids were thought to arise by internalizing an ancient bacteria. Plastids have internal membranes, and so when they were internalized by cells, they actually have three membranes instead of just two, like mitochondria. So what I'd like you to remember or think about while you're reading is basic anatomy, what the organelles are, what they do. You've probably seen this before, so that'll be uh, fairly straightforward. Topology, so what's inside and what's outside. The lumen is the inside, just like the lumen of the intestines are the inside of the intestines. How do proteins get to each organelle? Each organelle has a, its own set of proteins, so protein targeting is the topic for how proteins <coughs> go to their different places. Then, proteins are transported from one organelle to another and sorted in sorting organelles. So targeting, transport, and sorting. So here's your basic cell. Nucleus, cytoplasm, containing organelles, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus typically hangs around near the microtubule organizing center. Actin filaments on the outside, we'll talk more about those later and various other organelles, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a network of membranes that extends throughout the cell. So how do proteins know how to get from 
being, being translated either in the cytoplasm by three ribosomes or on different <coughs> round ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Proteins have targeted sequences. There's two basic methods. One is the signal sequence gated transport, which takes proteins into their various locations. That's one thing. The other thing is vesicular transport. That is organelles, but small vesicles, and then they fuse with the target organelle. This diagram on my left is useful for classifying types of transport. The red part, nuclear import, is different than all other types. It's similar to transmembrane transport, except it's not transmembrane. The nuclear core is a big hole in which big things can go through. The blue bits are transmembrane, <coughs> transmembrane transport. And proteins have to be unfolded to go through a membrane bilayer. Once proteins are in to the endoplasmic reticulum, they're transported by vesicular transport throughout the cell in the endomembrane system. Proteins go through the cell, <coughs> they can be secreted, they can be attached to the plasma membrane, they can be internalized into early endosomes, late endosomes, and degraded in lysosomes. That's all vesicular transport. So two key points. Signal sequences are an entry ticket into organelles. One time I was at the University of Miami doing my senior thesis, and I crashed a frat party. And I knocked at the door because a guy told me to come. And he said, I'm sorry, it's a closed party. And I said, OK. I didn't have my ticket. I couldn't get into that. But my friend saw me in the It was a weird party. Vesicular transport is, that is vesicles budding from one organelle and fusing with another. Budding and fusion are the key points. You can take signal sequences, the entry ticket, to get into the party, to get into the ER, and you can use recombinant DNA to splice them from one protein to another. So a protein that's normally targeted to the lumen inside of the ER has this red, the signal sequence. You can splice that off and put it on this green protein, which is normally in the cytoplasm, and lo, the green protein gets into the lumen and the blue protein stays in the cytoplasm. It doesn't have its ticket. I'm sorry, it's a closed part. Is that only done in the lab? Or in that, like, does it happen in nature for one amino acid straight in the splice to give it to the The question is, does that only happen in the lab? The answer is no. There are mutations which um, will block transport, and that, those mutations are sometimes found in genetic diseases. Good question. Just So let's talk first about nuclear import. The nuclear membrane is contiguous with the ER. Okay? It's part of the endoplasmic reticulum. There are holes in this double membrane. The ER lumen is inside, and it extends to the nuclear membrane. The holes go through the two membranes, and that's the nuclear pore complex. The nuclear pore complex is kind of like a sea anemone. It's got a kind of basket-like structure on the inside, and it's supported by a cytoskeletal network called the nuclear lamina, nuclear lamina on the inside of cell. It has these tendrils or fibrils that extend into the cytoplasm. And they're kind of like a sea anemone. <coughs> that is, they extend and they contract when nuclear import receptors bind to them. 
My EM, the basket parts, look like this. You can kind of see the basket bits extending up. And you can see the uh, membrane structure. And from the top, that's this part, they look a little bit like this. And from the side, here's the double membrane, and here's the nuclear pore complex with the basket on the nuclear side. Okay, what's the ticket? A string of five positively charged amino acids, lysines or arginines, can be anywhere on the protein. Large protein complexes, if they have this ticket, this positively charged patch, can go through this nuclear pore complex. Even ribosomes, big stuff, okay? Proteins do not need to be unfolded to go through a nuclear pore complex. There are nuclear import receptors which are recognized by these long tendrils. These receptors bind to this little Rudolph the Red-Nosed Ranger here. This is the nuclear import signal or sequence, nuclear localization sequence that has the five positive charged amino acids. Receptors bind to them. The receptors interact with these fibrils and are taken into the core, and then the receptors associate and goes back out. It used to be thought that the receptors kind of ratcheted down, right? But recently, last year in fact, it was discovered that these tendrils actually are more like a sea anemone than we thought. They actually contract when they bind the nuclear import receptors. So if you've ever stuck your finger in a sea anemone in the ocean, sea anemones grab your finger. Right? Do you ever see your finger? They kind of grab it and try to pull it in. That's what these things do. It's kind of like that. So, it's a little more complicated than this, of course. There are nuclear export receptors. And these are governed by um, molecular switching devices that use GTP, which I'll talk about more later. So how bidirectional transport is regulated. There's a lot of traffic of RNAs go through, right, translations, ribosomes, transcription factors. The traffic system has not been fully working. Very interesting topic for research. So, I'm going to stand right in the middle of this. Let's mutate the nuclear localization sequence, just as Justin proposed. So here it is on a protein that's linked to something fluorescent, okay? green fluorescent protein. Five positively charged amino acids. And here's what the cells look like when you have this glowing protein. These are all just the nuclei. So in our cell diagram, if just the nuclei is stained, it looks like this. Okay? So these are all cells. You can't see the cell borders because the proteins are all going into the nucleus. So let's mutate the nuclear localization signal. <laughs> make a threonine instead of lysine. What would we expect? Well, if we take our diagram of the cell, if a protein can only be in the cytoplasm, the nucleus will look like a big hole, right? Well, lo and behold, that's what it looks like. Here's some cells. The nuclei look like holes. This doesn't get it into the nucleus. So in this way, people can identify mutations and what works and what doesn't work for nuclear import. Let's talk about the endoplasmic reticulum next. The endoplasmic reticulum is a network of membranes throughout the cell. Plants, animals, any eukaryotic cell has a vast network of membrane. And it's both rough and smooth. Rough means it has ribosomes on it. Looks rough. Smooth means it doesn't. Lipid synthesis occurs in a smooth protein translation for proteins going into the ER is in the rock. <laughs> Key point. Proteins must be unfolded to get across membranes. You know when you go on a date, you always have a chaperone? You know, 
like the mob was this here? Proteins are refolded in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum by chaperones. These bind to the unfolded protein, kind of let it uh, fold in a natural way. It's, it, these chaperones are, are understood a little bit more than that. They're kind of like a hollow cylinder that allows the proteins to sample multiple conformations until they reach the most stable one. So proteins must be unfolded <coughs> to be translocated, and then they're refolded by chaperones. How do people learn about these tickets? Well, you can study protein import by isolating bits of the endoplasmic particulate, breaking, breaking them up into these vesicles called proteins. <coughs> You can separate rough from smooth using centrifugation. So rough, because they have proteins, all these ribosomes, on the outside, they're more dense. So they can be separated by a sucrose-free. And here's what they look like. Microsomes with membranes and these little dots are actually the ribosomes. So you can isolate these microsomes and you can do experiments. Let's do an experiment. Let's make a, ro a protein radioactive. We'll make two proteins, one with a signal sequence, that's this red bit, and one without. Mix them together with vesicles, microsomes, and ask if they've gone in. How do you know if they've gone in? Well, there's two ways. One, you can separate free protein from the vesicles, again, using the separate <coughs> Because if you put the, the, uh, the aggregate onto a sucrose gradient, and centrifuge, the vesicles are more dense and more massive, and they'll separate. So if the protein goes with the vesicles, you know it's attached, probably inside. You can tell whether it's inside or attached by adding a protease to the vesicles. Choose up all the free proteins, or anything that's just attached to the cell surface. Protein that's been imported, because it has its signal sequence, will be protected from the protein. You can tell that the protease is working if you add detergent, which disrupts the membrane, and then the protease will chew up the protein. So that's how people discover these kinds of things. Protein import into endoplasmic reticulum requires an ER signal sequence, which is a string of 18 to 30 mostly, mostly hydrophobic amino acids. That's the entry ticket. This led to the signal hypothesis. Günther Blobel got her, the Nobel Prize for this in 2000. He's an amazing man. He works at the Rockefeller University in New York. In essence, the signal hypothesis states that polyribosomes, which have an RNA with multiple ribosomes attached, during translation are recognized <laughs> This nascent polypeptide chain with the signal sequence is recognized by a signal recognition protein, <coughs> which then takes it to the membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum. And a translocation core assembles. The signal sequence is cleaved, and the protein is squirted through this pore, amazingly, unfolded during translation. After translation, the ribosome dissociates and the pore closes. It's not a permanent pore, there's a plug. But it's still not completely understood why this doesn't leak, because it doesn't, it doesn't even leak calcium. So that's the signal hypothesis. So the signal recognition particle that binds to the nascent polypeptide chain is actually a ribonucleo, ribonucleo protein. Okay? It's got RNA in it, just like the ribosome. And all of this is governed by molecular switching devices that use GTP hydrolysis. Signal hypothesis. Oh, and did I say proteins must be unfolded to be translocated? They're really not even fully translated yet, right? So it's co-translational import. Post-translational import is possible in certain conditions in yeast. 
But this is the predominant way of getting proteins into the inside of the endoplasmic Signal sequences can also guide membrane proteins to be part of the membrane. Signal sequences are typically cleaved, but the second greasy bit, hydrophobic part, that serves as the transmembrane domain, acts as a stop sequence. So translation continues to make the full polypeptide chain on the outside of the ER, facing the cytoplasm. Proteins have multiple membrane spanning domains, and oh, don't forget, proteins have to get folded to transcript. Proteins have multiple membrane spanning domains, and your book goes through many examples, which you should look at, about how multiple spanning domains uh, can be inserted. You can have first a start transfer sequence, then a stop transfer sequence, and you can have multiple start and stop transfer sequences. In this way, proteins with multiple membrane spanning domains can be inserted during translation. Proteins glycosylation and other covalent modifications of a protein occurs in the lumen, that's the inside. Carbohydrates are added as branched polymers. Actually, it starts right during translation in the endoplasmic particulate. These sugars are trimmed and modified in various ways in the Golgi apparatus. And the proteins form part of the cell surface, the glycocalyx. That's, that's part involved in cell-cell recognition and protein stability. So glycosylation occurs in the ER and the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so we're going to move to mitochondria. Protein import into mitochondria can be studied similar to microsomes. You can isolate mitochondria in the centrifuge. And you can make a radioactive protein with something you think might be the signal sequence. If the protein gets stuck on the, on the original surface, a protease can chew it up, just like before. If it gets inside, it's protected from the protease. And you know that the protease is working because you can add detergent to poke holes in the membrane. So in this, with this kind of experiment, people discovered that the signal sequence to get into mitochondria is this, an antipathic helix. You remember hydrophobic, hydrophilic. If you have both of those characteristics, you're empty okay? So it has a, a greasy bit and a water-loving bit. And so the receptor has something that recognizes both of those. Empty pathic So that's the entry ticket into mitochondria. Protein, so mitochondria have two membranes. How do you get them? And, and only a few of the proteins are encoded by mitochondrial DNA. Most are encoded by nuclear genes. So you gotta get you gotta fill the mitochondria with all this stuff so it can do all these wonderful things. So there are outer membrane transport complexes, TOM transport to outer membrane, inner membrane transport complexes, TIM, TIMS and TOM. The signal sequence is often cleaved in mitochondria just as in the lumen of the ER. So there's a lot of topological problems here. So proteins can get just here, like cytochrome C, or into the matrix, or be part of the membrane. Okay. Oh, and by the way, proteins must be unfolded to get across the membrane, okay? This is in common with the endoplasmic particulate. Point. Then they're refolded by chaperone. Chloroplasts have an extra membrane, the thylakoids, and they have another signal sequence to get the proteins into the thylakoid space. Okay. So we've gone through 
protein import into the nucleus through those nuclear pores. Proteins don't have to be unfolded. Big things can get through. The nuclear localization signal is a string of five positively charged amino acids. Protein import into mitochondria, ER, other organelles, such as peroxidomes. These are organelles of oxidation. <coughs> Proteins must be unfolded to be translocated, and they need an entry ticket, a signal sequence, which is different for the different organelles. Okay, so now we're going to be into the endoplasmic reticulum. Let's just focus on that. From the endoplasmic reticulum, there's traffic to and from the Golgi, to and from the plasma membrane, and to later zones and lysosomes. <coughs> Vesicular transport is the way proteins get from one organelle to another in the endomembrane system. That involves budding from a donor compartment, forming a small vesicle, and then this vesicle has to be targeted and fused with the acceptor compartment. Budding and fusion. So in this way, small vesicles are transported from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, from the Golgi directly to the plasma membrane, and so on. Budding and pain. So how do proteins know where to go? Here's another question. How are proteins sorted? If you got all these vesicles budding, how do they know where to feed? It's specific, so there's targeting, and I'll tell you how that works. So here's a diagram of the entire endomembrane system. Here's the ER. It buds vesicles and forms this intermediate compartment. And the intermediate compartment becomes the cis face of the Golgi. The Golgi has these uh, flat parts called cisterna. And vesicles go from one cisterna to another. It used to be thought that vesicles go in both directions, going forward and back. But now the thinking is that these cisterna actually mature and become the next one, cis, medial, and trans. <coughs> and proteins that need to be in the ER or in earlier stages are taken back by, by retrograde directions. Vesicles are budding, really going in this direction. Backwards. From the trans Golgi, we have many options. We can go directly to the plasma membrane in the secretory pathway. And that's the default pathway. That's all cells have this. You gotta get stuff to the outside of the cell and to the cell surface. Some cells, like endocrine cells or nerve cells, have regulated, regulated secretory vesicles, which are stored until there's a stimulation, and then they fuse and release their contents. So polypeptide hormones, neurotransmitters, things like that are stored. But wait, there's more. From the plasma membrane, proteins are internalized and fuse with, the vesicles fuse with early endosomes. From early endosomes, you can either recycle back to the membrane, the plasma membrane, or late endosome, which then um, fuses with lysosomes. Lysosomal enzymes are taken from the trans Golgi network. Lysosomes contain all these proteases and nucleases, things that chew up proteins. You don't want them in the cytoplasm, right? So they're delivered specifically to late endosomes and which then are delivered to lysosomes. So one year, uh, I asked people to draw this entire endomembrane system for the exam. And you should try this, because it's not that hard. It's just a way of keeping everything straight. Maybe we'll do that as a discussion group activity. So how is specificity <coughs> Okay. There are coat proteins that bud, that cause the budding of vesicles from different compartments. So there are different types of coats. You can isolate them 
and they look different by electron microscopy. Clathrin is found on the plasma membrane, secretory vesicles, and the trans Golgi network. It has a characteristic cage structure. These guys, COP1 codimer protein 1 and 2, have different sort of more fuzzy morphology. COP1 regulates retrograde transport. That's the blue bit here. The traffic going back to the ER. COP2 regulates formation of the <coughs> to go forward from the ER to the Golgi. So there's different coats. Okay, this is a theme I'm going to say now and I'm going to return to. A lot of the <coughs> events in membrane traffic and signaling and cytoskeletal organization are governed by this simple device, a molecular switch. Okay? It's an on-off switch where a protein binds to GTP and is in its on state. Then the GTP is hydrolyzed, releasing phosphate, to go to its off state. Many, many processes are regulated by GTPases. So the formation of those coats that I just told you about, clathrin vesicle pinching off, which I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, nuclear import, those receptors, nuclear import, nuclear export, those receptors are governed by these molecular switches. Also ER import and vesicle targeting, as well as translation initiation, termination, cytoskeleton dynamics, and signal transduction. So we'll save this last part for later. But this is a general theme in all of cell biology, is molecular switches. That's what GTP is good for. There's a little bit of use of GTP, like ATP for energy. This is the main thing. There's a lot of GTP in cells because of the citric acid cycle. It's used for these switching devices. Proteins must be properly <coughs> folded because they're unfolded when they transfer. <coughs> and there are chaperones. These help the proteins fold. If they don't fold, there's a certain amount that don't fold. They're targeted for degradation. Once they're folded properly, they can be recognized by specific receptors. There are signal sequences. That's this little red bit. ABPL is one of them. That's recognized by these um, components of the coat, which then assemble the coat and cause this protein to be included into the budding vesicle. There are sorting signals for ER retention. <coughs> ER retrieval, and they're different for membrane proteins and soluble proteins. So there are entry tickets within the lumen of the endomembrane system, just like getting into it in the first place. So COP1 and COP2 regulate transport to 1, return to the Golgi and back to the ER. And clathrin works slightly differently. It works on the plasma membrane and in secretory vesicles and vesicles destined for later zones and lysosomes. Clathrin is a really cool mo a molecule. It's the, the, the base of it is called a triskelion, and there's pictures of it in your book. These things self-assemble into these cages, so pretty cool. And they assemble around these adaptins, which again recognize proteins to be included, such as this red thing here in the budding vessel. Clathrin is different in that it has a special GTPase called dynamin, which forms a collar around <coughs> the budding vessel and uses GTP hydrolysis to regulate pinching off of the vesicle. Flies that have a mutant in this GTP, it's dynamic, will spontaneously just freeze. Synaptic vesicles are formed from endosomes, and the membrane proteins have to be recycled. So when dynamic doesn't work, you get these structures here. This is an EM. Here's the collars, and here's the clathrin coated pits. They can't recycle their synaptic vesicle membrane proteins. 
say this stuff. This is called Shibiri. So how is fusion regulated? We've got a lot of vesicles floating around in this cell. How are they going to know where to go? Two major classes of proteins. One is the RABs. These are small GTPases. They recognize stocking reaction. Okay, so they're the initial targeting. The second class are snares. Snares are um, they're, they're these um, long alpha helices, which kind of wrap around each other. And there are specific snares for the vesicle, V-snares, and for the target, T-snares. So they recognize each other, and they form this kind of cocked spring, which the energy from which actually drives membrane diffusion, drives the opening up of the two bilayers. And there's an ATPase that actually unwinds them after diffusion. So RABs and snares, targeting and fusion, docking and fusion. <coughs> Okay, the Golgi is beautiful. In the movie, we saw a picture of the Golgi, right? It's this planar structure with little holes in it. And there's a cis, medial, and trans base. It's involved in glycosylation and other post-translational modifications. And sorting. So, from the Golgi, you can get to late endosomes and lysosomes, or you can go into these two types of secretory vesicles. So glycosylation and sorting, two functions of the gold. From the gold gene, there are two secretory pathways, regulated and constitutive. Membrane proteins and also soluble proteins are delivered, delivered to the cell surface or extracellular space. <coughs> Constitutive secretion happens in all cells. It's the default pathway. Proteins are delivered to the plasma membrane that way in all cells. In cells that possess a regulated secretory pathway, there's a stimulus that causes the vesicles with their stored hormone to fuse with the plasma membrane, releasing their contents. So for example, your pituitary has a bunch of polypeptide hormones, which are told to secrete at certain times. And this causes secretion of the hormones into the bloodstream. So here's what dense core, these polypeptide hormones are stored in dense core secretory vesicles. And here's what they look like just before and just after fusion. So that's regulated secretion. I talked about the action potential and neurotransmitters. That's another example of regulated secretion. Neurotransmitters are stored in synaptic vesicles. In this case, the membrane depolarization drives voltage-gated calcium channels to let the calcium in, which causes diffusion. The neurotransmitter is released, and the neurotransmitter interacts with the, uh, the cell. Okay, one more topic, endocytosis. Cell eating for large stuff is called phagocytosis. And receptors bind to their ligands for signal transmission. Those are endocytosis by clathrin mediated endocytosis. So, for example, low density lipoprotein has a receptor, so LDL, even LDL, it, it contains fats and cholesterol, it's a big particle. The LDL receptor binds to the LDL. It's included in the clavicle pits, which lose their coat and fuse with the sorting enzyme. The particle dissociates, dissociates and it's delivered to lysosomes, where the cholesterol and other lipids are redeemed. The receptor recycles back to the plasma membrane for another round of endocytosis. Things delivered to lysosomes get chewed up in various ways by all these ACEs, proteases, <coughs> nucleases, light bases, and so on. Some cells are specialized for fighting bacteria and can actually eat whole bacteria. There's a cool movie about this. 
So that's called phagocytosis, the phagosome with the bacteria is delivered to lysosomes. In addition, mitochondria that are old or have no more use are also auto um, phagocytized. They're enclosed in the membrane, delivered to lysosomes, so their parts can be recycled. There is an ATPase that makes lysosomes the most stable organelle. So the lumen of uh, the ER has this proton ATPase. And this is present throughout the pathway, proton ATPase, which causes protons to be pumped inside. And the pH gradually lowers 6.8. To 5.5, guys <laughs> still wait. In secretory vesicles, 6.8 in endosomes to 6 to 5 in places. So organelles are progressively acidified throughout the membrane. Right I'm not sure if it's down on the table or whatever. The endosomes are sorting work for us. From endosomes, from the early endosomes, you can recycle back to the plasma membrane or go to late endosomes and lysosomes. In addition, synaptic vesicles are formed from endosomes. So you should study this diagram in your book to learn how synaptic vesicles are formed from endosomes. And I'll let you scare at that one minute. The cytoplasm is packed with organelles. <laughs> Good thing we have to take those. Um, 